Stonehenge was first discovered in the 1620s, and today, over four centuries later, we're no closer to the truth about this strange site. But all of that might have just changed. A groundbreaking discovery at Stonehenge has everyone shocked. Join us as we bring you the details about this crazy discovery and how it changes everything. Stonehenge is a prehistoric monument located on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England. It is situated about two miles west of Amesbury. The monument is characterized by a circular arrangement of large standing stones made of sarsen, a type of sandstone. These stones are approximately 13 feet tall, 7 feet wide, and weigh around 25 tons each. They are topped by horizontal lintel stones that connect them. Inside the outer ring of sarsen stones, there is a circle of smaller stones known as blue stones. Further inside, you can find freestanding trilithons, which are composed of two sturdy vertical sarsen stones connected by one lintel stone. The place is now in a state of partial ruin, but even then you can see that it's carefully aligned so that it faces the direction of the sunrise during the summer solstice and the direction of the sunset during the winter solstice. The entire monument is within earthworks, which include a circular ditch and bank. This earthwork is considered the earliest phase of the monument's construction and dates back to about 3100 BC. From what we've gathered over the past century, the initial phase of Stonehenge's construction involved the creation of a circular earthwork. This consisted of a ditch, which was dug into the ground, and a bank, which was formed from the excavated soil. This circular feature enclosed the area where the monument would later be built. Radiocarbon dating suggests that some of the blue stones, which are a type of volcanic rock, may have been present at the Stonehenge site as early as 3000 BC. These stones are believed to have been brought from a quarry in the Preseli Hills of Wales, over 150 miles away. The most iconic aspect of Stonehenge, the large standing sarsen stones, were most likely erected during this phase. These sarsen stones, which are made of a type of sandstone, were transported from the Marlborough Downs, located about 20 miles north of Stonehenge. The stones were shaped and arranged in a circular formation, with lintels placed on top to create the characteristic trilithons and outer ring. Radiocarbon dating indicates that the blue stones were repositioned within the monument during this phase. It is believed that the blue stones were originally arranged in a double circle within the monument, but they were later reorganized into the smaller circle and horseshoe arrangement that we see today. Stonehenge continued to be used and modified over the centuries. It is thought that additional stones may have been added or rearranged during this period. By the Late Bronze Age, around 1600 BC, the monument's primary construction phases were likely complete. Stonehenge received legal protection as a scheduled monument in 1882, and in 1986, Stonehenge was added to the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Not only does that put Stonehenge on the map, but it also means that deeper studies can be conducted to figure out what this strange site really is and why it was made. And well, a lot of information has been found. Recent research on the Stonehenge altar stone indicates that it originates from a region significantly farther north than the other stones at the site. This revelation means that there needs to be a total re-evaluation of the origins of the various monoliths at Stonehenge. It also raises questions about why it differs in source location from the other stones at Stonehenge. This disparity in provenance challenges previously held beliefs about the geographic origins of the monument's central stones, which were that all the stones in the inner circle, including the altar stone, originated from the Preseli region in West Wales. A century ago, British geologist Herbert Henry Thomas conducted a study of Stonehenge and proposed that the stones in the inner circle, including the altar stone, were sourced from the Preseli region in West Wales. He noted a distinction in provenance between the inner and outer circle stones, and his claims seemed like they were the cold, hard truth. But the recent study, led by Richard Bevins, a professor of geology and earth sciences at Aberystwyth University, challenges Thomas's theory. 
It suggests that while Thomas was accurate in identifying the source of some of the inner circle stones, the altar stone likely originates from an unknown quarry in the north of Great Britain. The altar stone stands out due to its larger size and different rock type compared to the other stones at Stonehenge. This distinction has prompted questions about its origin and how it fits into the site's history. The absence of archaeological evidence indicating the arrival of the altar stone at Stonehenge raises the possibility that it may have been brought to the site at a later date. This challenges the assumption that it was part of the original construction. Archaeologists have conducted a thorough comparative study involving the geochemistry and mineralogy of the altar stone. They have compared these characteristics with the rock composition of over 50 different sites, spanning from South Wales to the west of England. So far, the analysis have not yielded conclusive results in terms of identifying a specific source for the altar stone. Despite extensive efforts, the stone's geological signature hasn't matched at any of the known sites examined in the study. Not even one. The altar stone contains an unusually high quantity of the chemical element barium. This distinctive feature adds to how hard it is to identify its source, as it differs significantly from the compositions of other known stone sources. But the composition isn't the only strange thing going on here. A recent research conducted by universities and historic England in the vicinity of Stonehenge has also uncovered significant insights into the area that surrounds Stonehenge. For most of history, our focus has been on Stonehenge itself, the monument, not the area around it. But maybe that's where we should have been looking all along. Using advanced geophysical techniques, researchers have identified more than just the North Barrow in the area. Instead, they have uncovered evidence suggesting the existence of potentially up to a dozen small circular or oval enclosures. These features are characterized by surrounding ditches and external earthen banks. Not just that, but many of these enclosures incorporate circles formed by upright posts. Archaeologists have given these enclosures the designation of henges, a term inspired by Stonehenge itself. This classification means that there's a shared architectural or structural characteristic with the iconic Stonehenge monument. By the way the monument is created, it's clear that these sites served religious or ceremonial purposes, although we still don't know which specific rituals or ceremonies were conducted within them. The henges are considered to be hubs of religious or spiritual activity in the ancient landscape surrounding Stonehenge. That might sound all peaceful, but it's possible that there was a lot of violence within these stones. In 1953, Professor Richard Atkinson, while studying Stonehenge, noticed carvings of an early Bronze Age dagger and axe head on one of the upright Sarzen stones. What's crazy is that when a thorough examination of early photographs of the monument was conducted, it was immediately clear that these carvings were present, but no one really noticed them before. Following Atkinson's initial discovery, more carvings were gradually unearthed over the years. By 2005, a total of three daggers and 44 axe heads had been identified on the stones. These carvings were of distinctive shapes that resembled the axes and daggers used during the Early Bronze Age, specifically around 1750-1500 BC. But the most interesting thing here is that these carvings were made approximately 1,000 years after the stones were originally erected at Stonehenge. This implies a later cultural and ceremonial activity associated with the site, where the ancient builders chose to embellish the existing stones with these carvings. To further investigate these carvings, Historic England commissioned a high-resolution laser scan of the stones. This advanced technology revealed an additional 71 axe head carvings and one possible new dagger. This remarkable discovery effectively doubled the known number of early Bronze Age axe head carvings in all of Britain. Could these axes be a sign that this place was used for something much darker than worship? 
An Anglo-Saxon skeleton was unearthed in a shallow grave located just outside the Stonehenge Stone Circle. The skeleton was transported to London for further study. Unfortunately, during the turmoil of World War II, it was believed to have been lost during the Blitz. Thankfully, in the 1980s, archaeologist Mike Pitts rediscovered the skeleton at the Royal College of Surgeons. Specialists conducted a comprehensive examination of the skeleton, leading to crucial revelations about the individual's life and death. It was confirmed that the skeleton belonged to a young man who had met a violent end. He had been decapitated with a sharp metal blade, most likely a sword, by a single right-handed blow to the back of the neck. Radiocarbon dating provided key insights into the timeline of this tragic event. The analysis indicated that the decapitation occurred between approximately A.D. 660 and 890. Could we have been looking at Stonehenge the wrong way this whole time? Has it been grounds for execution, where the axes represent the number of people that were killed there? If that's the case, when did the practice really end? And how could such violent history just get lost to time? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos just like this. We'll see you in the next one.